say no. It's not. It's not a free country. It's a very scary place. And that's exactly what Canada has become under Justin Trudeau. And the second you decide to tell the truth about something, you are filled with this, I don't want to get supernatural, but you are filled with this power from somewhere else. Try it. Tell the truth about something. It, you feel it every day. The more you tell the truth, the stronger you become. to be here. Now, Berta, that's exactly right. Al freaking Berta, as we call it. Um, I was so excited to be here that I actually called the CBC and I said, I'm in town, which they were aware of, and uh, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to as many Canadians as possible. And I talked, we talked to a very nice guy. Uh, I think he's new there. Uh, and he's like, sure. And we called back, and, and they actually we were speaking in Calgary earlier, and they had a CBC guy there. And I said, look, I would love to talk to the CBC. I'll answer any question you like, and I dare you to put it on TV. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I wasn't just outraged because there's a media, state media organization that's totally opposed to free speech. which was a little weird, since the media should be the defenders of the things that you know, make their careers possible. Um, but it also offended me personally because I feel like I have some ownership of the CBC, not because I'm a Canadian taxpayer, but because I am secretly, and I never reveal this part, Canadian. And I am. I am. And I wouldn't say this, honestly, to an audience in Los Angeles or New York or Denver because I don't want to be singled out, you know, or treated differently. Um, but it's actually true. My dad's family's from Nova Scotia. And... Um, Actually, we had a place in Nova Scotia my whole life until a few years ago when we sold it to a guy called Gerald Cotton, um, who mysteriously died sort of of colitis in India with uh, the keys to like a billion dollars in Bitcoin. And the New York Times called me and suggested that I was in on his Bitcoin scam, which for the record I'm not. But anyway, um, I have ties to this country and I spent a lot of my life coming here and, and I just love it. And that's why I'm here. And... Woo! Oh, I mean that. And I like Canada because I understand what Canada is, and it's not oh, not attacking Toronto, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I mispronounce all Canadian names just to infuriate people and see if I can make them laugh, but they never do. <laughs> I'm in Alberta, Calgary, Ottawa, in Canada. And no one ever... Thank you for laughing. I love that. Can anyone ever accuse the Canadians of being humorless? They're just too polite to laugh in public, so but thank you. And I, I called it Ottawa many, many times, and I would get these outraged. You don't even know enough about our country to pronounce the name correctly. And, of course, it was intentional until I received a very sincere email from an Ojibwa First Nations leader who said, actually, it's, it's called Ottawa. And uh, <laughs> they've been for mispronouncing it all these years. That, I'm not making that up. And if you have any Ojibwe friends, ask them. It, yeah, it's Ottawa. So uh, your creepy prime minister can put on the costumes of other cultures, but he doesn't really understand them. Um, Woo! Yeah! But I'll be honest, there are two things that I like about Canada, and both are totally sincere. This is not a pander. One, I like the physical country. I think it's the prettiest country in the world. And I mean, Woo! I've been all over it, and no one in Canada talks about it, actually. You know, they talk about cool things about Canada, but they never mention the fact that it's prettier than Switzerland, and it's the second biggest country in the world, and there are only 40 million people in it. And I think that's the greatest, I think that's the greatest ratio I can imagine. 
and I hear uh, your friends in Ottawa saying we've got to, you know, we've got to make this country as packed as Bangladesh because, you know, a crowded country is a happy country. Um, and I think to myself, you're really sick, actually. <laughs> I've been in places in Labrador and northern Quebec that I'm not sure another human being has ever been to. You know, your mountain's not far from here. You go there and there's like not another person around, just you and what God made. And it's just the most inspiring, edifying experience. And I, if I were Prime Minister of Canada, I would mandate, I would, I would take some public lands and I would allocate them to the entire 40 million who live here. And I would say, everybody gets six acres. And I command that you spend at least a week there. I mean it. And get out of your little cube with your food delivery and your weed and your stupid internet service. <laughs> And go sit in the dirt in the God's most beautiful country and enjoy it. And then you'll understand what Canada is. I mean it. I mean it. And go catch a trout. And you don't have to kill it, but catch it. And see the kind of fish and or a walleye. You don't have to go shoot a moose, though you can. But you should know the country that you live in. And you shouldn't just be clustered near the border of, like, Detroit. What? <laughs> Spread out a little. <laughs> and people who have a little bit of contact with the natural world and the animals that live in it are a little bit clear thinking, I have to say. And I met a bunch of them tonight in the photo line. And you could just feel the vibe coming off them. These are people who are taking the long view on life because they know what it is. You know, and they know how precious it is, and they know how little control they have. Because when you farm, you really don't have control. And I don't care how many agronomy degrees you have or how clever you are in your planning, in the end, you don't control the weather. Despite, you know, the really fierce attempts of the US government to control the weather, they don't. <laughs> and neither does Justin Trudeau, he doesn't, because he's not God, I don't want to blow his mind or anything. Yeah. <laughs> and when you realize that you're not God, you have hit upon the root of all wisdom. I am not God. All goodness flows from that realization. If you don't reach that conclusion, then in the end, you find yourself very tempted to commit genocide. Because it's true. And everyone who has has reached the conclusion, the same conclusion, I am God. So let's just start there. So anyway, I love this country and I admire its natural resources. And I think you could have one of the greatest economies in the world with a population of 40 million and some of the deepest energy reserves in the world and mineral deposits in the world. And I've been to a lot of your extraction sites, I'm just saying. And, you know, extraction is an ugly business by its nature, but Canadians, true to form, have really done their best to make it as tidy and respectful as they can. And I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. You've never seen more conscientious energy extraction than in Canada. They, like, apologize for taking it out. It's great. Um, so I love that. And the other thing I love about Canada are the people, and I love the thing that other people mock Canadians for, which is their, their politeness. Their sort of Anglo commitment to never offending you no matter what, no matter how much they hate you. Even the CBC today, they were like sort of apologizing for calling me a Nazi, like, well, we'd love to have one, but we have to have another meeting, and uh, <laughs> we've got to do another segment on intersectionality. And obviously, they know that I'm a racist because I don't believe in climate change and I'm not trans, because that makes sense. And that's the sum total of their entire programming schedule. Woo! Slip on the CBC. Uh, by the way, oh, in breaking news today, you're a racist. Oh, eh? Yeah. Um, so obviously, they're loathsome and bent on my destruction, but they're very polite about it, which I appreciate. I do, because I believe in, oh, there's Theo Flory right there. Without my glasses, I see it. Um, and I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. And I strive to be a politer person, and I'm not always, and I obviously, you know, can offend people and use profanity, but in my heart, as an Anglo, honestly, I really strive to be polite. And you, you all pull it off in a way that's just remarkable and admirable, and thank you for that, for adding to the sum total of civility in the world. We love but, you, Tucker! But, thank you. But here's my, here's my concern. And... And it is part of a larger concern that that people's best qualities are leveraged against them. And that what unscrupulous people in power do, if they're smart, is they don't dispatch an army of young men in tight uniforms to goose step through your town because it's a little bit too obvious. You've seen that movie. 
and you sort of know what happens next. You take up arms, you form a resistance, you drive the people out, and freedom returns, right? You guys have seen that movie. It's been done about 50,000 times. And oh, if only that's what we were facing. Because that is straightforward. That's the kind of masculine expression of fascism. But the West is now facing a far slyer opponent, which is the feminine expression of fascism. The Christia Freeland version of fascism. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. And I know a lot about this because I knew Christia Freeland uh, when she you know, was a journalist at the Financial Times, whose name shall forever live in infamy for employing her. And I remember even then thinking, this woman is not bright at all. But boy, does she have high self-esteem. I don't think I've ever even seen it's off, it's off the, I don't know what the self-esteem measurement scale is, the Richter scale. But her self-esteem was literally unassailable. It was bomb-proof. If a nuclear bomb dropped on your town, you could hide beneath Christia Freeland's self-esteem and live. <laughs> There's like nothing you could do to shake it. Nothing. No amount of evidence of her stupidity and wrong decisions and idiotic views could dissuade her from the core belief that she was awesome and you were not. And I kind of stood back in admiration. So I guess I shouldn't be totally shocked that she's helping to run and destroy your country. But she's doing it in, a, in her signature way. She's not getting on the CBC, her media outlet, which, like almost all outlets in this wonderful, oppressed country, is run by the government. It's all state media. It's Albania, 1985. And I'm sure we have people whose families were refugees from Albania. Welcome. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. But at least you could say of the Albanian leader in 1985, Enver Hoxha, that when he went full fascist, he just like didn't mince words. Shut up and obey or we'll shoot you. Christian Freeland is wise enough, clever enough, in her serpent-like way, to make it all about your protection and safety. All about your protection and safety. No, we're just trying to help you. That's why you're in shackles. You're being arrested right now for your safety. Oh, it's for the common good. Don't worry, you'll understand. I always want to say, Mrs. Freeling, can I go to the bathroom? No, no, you can't. And you can just imagine her taking great, great glee as your fourth grade self wet his pants in class as Mrs. Freeland refuses to let you go to the bathroom. So that's kind of more diabolical than what we've seen in previous generations, and it's much more effective in a committedly polite country like Canada, because you don't know that it's happening. And because a demagogue like that, or your completely bizarre cross-dressing prime minister, <laughs> it's true, prime minister blackface, um, I, didn't, I didn't wear blackface, he did. Um, he, three times, thank you. Three times, and I want to thank you for your commitment to the facts. Prime um, Minister! Prime Minister! The Prime Minister, right, the Prime Minister. Um, their attack on your rights, which is an attack on you and your children, is cloaked in the language of therapy, self-help, and compassion. You're doing this for the common good. Don't you care about the elderly? And of course, being a decent person, you care very deeply about the elderly and the weakest in your society, of course. So what you don't realize is you shuffle off to abandon another God-given right to a totalitarian government is that this is not being done on behalf of a marginalized group or the weakest among us or the elderly. They hijack the language of the gospel to crush the gospel. That's exactly what they're doing. And it's hard to know, it's hard to sort of see this when you're right in the middle of it. If you've ever had a friend who is married to an alcoholic and gets divorced and everyone comes up and says, like, wow, your spouse was a raging drunk. And oftentimes the spouse is like, didn't really know. If you live with someone whose behavior is completely off the chain, sometimes you're not aware of it because you're too close to it. So let me just tell you from my perspective, as a foreigner, a semi-foreigner, with some Canadian blood in my veins, what I'm seeing. And here are the markers for the malice that undergirds these expressions of false compassion. We're just trying to help. Really, they're trying to help? How does it help you or your family when the government of British Columbia 
gives fentanyl to your children without your knowledge. That is literally happening right now. And it's been stopped by the premier here, who's not giving fentanyl to children. Amen. Bravo. Hard to believe you even have to say that. But it is happening right down the road, right over the mountains in British Columbia. What is that? It's not an expression of compassion. Fentanyl is the number one killer of people under 40 in the United States. Number one. There's no safe dosage of fentanyl. It's a poison. Manufactured in Mexico with Chinese precursors designed to kill people, and it does. And so to hand that to children without their parents' knowledge is what? An attempt to kill your children. What else could it be? That's not compassion. There's no other way to read that. And I just fear if you're in the middle of a society that says that's okay or it's on the spectrum of okay, it's something that we should consider, you may lose sight of the fact that that's not only completely unacceptable, it's a declaration of war against you and your children. People who are trying to kill your children are not your friend. They're your sworn blood enemy. Is there another way to interpret that? Am I being crazy? I don't think that I am. And in less developed countries, this would be very obvious. Go try that in Burkina Faso. I'm serious, show up in a Ouagadougou next week with a briefcase full of fentanyl and say, I'm gonna pass this out to the neighborhood kids, but I'm not gonna tell the parents. Those would be your last words. You, you would be ripped apart. You're coming to kill my children? No. They don't even have electricity in parts of Burkina Faso, but they have a gut level sense that your primary duty on this earth is to protect your children. If you can't protect your children, and not even spiritually or intellectually, just physically, then who are you? You're a husk, you're a shameful husk. That's what you are. There's no greater dereliction. There's no worse abandonment than leaving your children to be harmed in the hands of others. So, obviously, try that in Eastern Europe. Even Eastern Europe, which does have electricity. And by the way, no homelessness or graffiti or public drug use. How are they pulling that off? Amazing. I guess Bucharest, Romania is a, a lot more advanced than New York City now. Because they won't put up with it. And they won't put up with attacks on their own children. Because they haven't been socialized to the point where they've lost their souls. That's the truth. The MAID program, which nobody wants to talk about, because nobody, and again, this is, this is not an attack, it's a compliment. People here, I'm from a very similar culture, don't want to talk about things that make other people uncomfortable. So it really like is a Christmas dinner among the Episcopalians, where there's a lot of sort of semi-drunk, sullen silentness. You know what I mean? As people kind of secretly resent each other, but no one can say anything about it. And apparently, you know, at some point, someone get drunk enough just to say, I hate you. <laughs> Everyone puts their heads down again. The government of Canada is killing Canadians, and not just a few, and not just the terminally ill. Over 50,000 so far. 50,000. Any organization that kills 50,000 people is a genocidal organization. Period. And I don't care how you dress it up. That's just a fact. That's like a bottom line on a chart. How many people have you killed? Oh, 50,000. Oh, you're not in the good guy category. Sorry, we can't. We're gonna bring you up at The Hague, actually, where you should be. And now, under consideration, apparently next month, is a plan to expand the MADE program the, sy the systematic killing of Canadians, not all of whom are terminally ill, many of whom are just sad, because Canadian society has made them sad, they're gonna expand that to children. And that's the point at which you have to say, I'm sorry, we're, we're not gonna be polite anymore. You, can't, you literally can't do that. And I don't care if someone, you don't need to be, by the way, a religious freak to think it's wrong for a government to kill people at scale. And I don't care, choice, they'll dress it up. No, it's totally evil, is the truth. And it's deeply revealing of who they are and what they want. It's deeply revealing. The standard of living in Canada 
which secretly a lot of no American would ever tell you this because no American ever wants to well, think about Canada or admit that there are things about Canada that are cooler than the United States, including Iraqis, by the way, which are better. Sorry. But one of the things Canada always had was this incredibly robust middle class. It didn't have these super jagged wealth distributions that the United States had. It was much more like Scandinavia than Dallas. And I personally always liked that. I did. I mean, the downside was some of your you know, most energetic people left because they wanted to become billionaires, but a lot of really smart people stayed because they liked being around people like them and their neighbors and, and whatever. That is dying before your eyes. The Canadian standard of living is in free fall at exactly the moment when Canada is importing more people per capita than any nation in the world. It's the highest immigration rate in the world. So this is something that no Canadian will talk about. And you have to ask why. Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is, aforementioned, they don't want to offend anybody. And it's touchy and no one wants to be called a racist. It has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with population numbers and the strain on available resources public and private, housing prices, for example, your healthcare system, of which you were once so proud. It's so overburdened that it's easier to get into the MAID program than it is to schedule a surgery. It's easier to be killed by the government than healed by the government. That's true, look it up. So it's at exactly that point that they're like, oh, our country is underpopulated. In what sense? Who decided Canada was underpopulated? The second biggest country in the world with 40 million people in it? That sounds like paradise to me. Are you joking? And they're nice people. What is going on? The second reason no one wants to talk about it in Canada is because immigration has been a good thing for Canada over the years. Some of the coolest people in the world have moved to Canada and the United States, by the way. Immigration is not bad. Immigration can, many people here are the product of fairly recent immigration. It's good, but like anything, in the temporal world, it's not all good. It can be good. It can also be really bad. It can enhance your country. It can destroy your country. Choose. So if you have an immigration policy that makes your country stronger, your economy stronger, your country more cohesive, amen. And you have had that for generations. And everybody in Canada is happy about that. That's not what you have now. You have the wholesale importation of millions of people into your country for no obvious benefit at exactly the time when your housing prices are so out of control like can your kids afford a house no. this is true in my country too and so the question you have to ask is why are why is the government doing this is there an economic case to be made maybe there is i've never heard it maybe there's some central planner who's decided this is going to make us all much happier and much more prosperous they don't even attempt to convince you of that they just shout slogans in your face and if you ask a question they call you a racist and if you say but i'm actually not a racist and I'm not speaking for myself. I just want to know the answer. Why are you doing this? Without the consent of the governed, it's a decision you made unilaterally, and they won't answer your question. Diversity is our strength. Okay, that may be true, it may not be true. I don't know. It's a metaphysical question, actually. But in practical terms, why do we have the highest immigration rate in the world? Shut up! And of course, the answer is political power. Political power. This is a democracy. Your citizenship entitles you to choose your leaders. Your vote is valuable because there's a finite supply of those votes. It's very much unlike the Canadian dollar. <laughs> right? Or the US dollar. Which in a pinch they can just print more of. And then the Canadian dollars you have in your pocket are worth less. Worth less. Do you know anything about this? Have you heard this principle before? It's called supply and demand. And if you misuse it, if you ignore the most basic law of economics, you wind up with, repeat after me, inflation. With which you are familiar. Just inflation. Just inflation. The same principle holds for citizenship in a democracy. And if you don't like the way that the public votes, import new voters. And that's precisely what they're doing. This is, they're doing that in the United States as well. And here's my point you're taking it because no one's saying anything. And I'm just warning you that if this was a mistake, if these were policies formulated by people who actually loved you and just gone off course and were doing the wrong thing, as you often do with your kids. If you have children, you often make the wrong decision with your kids. But you're brought back on course by your love for your children. So over time, you make the right decisions because you're animated for a desire to protect them because you love them. 
But if you hated your children, all of your mistakes would be in one direction, and that direction would be toward destruction. And there is zero evidence that the Trudeau government loves you. And there's overwhelming evidence that they hate you and your families. Woo! How is that not true? If, if liberal and NDP politicians are sending fentanyl to your children, if they're trying to add your children to the list of people who can be killed by the state, who aren't even terminally ill, if they are changing the composition of your country without asking your permission, if every communication you have with Ottawa is a lecture about your moral deficiencies, you're a bad person, shut up racist. There's no love at all. There's only contempt. And the reason I'm saying this is not to upset anyone or hurt anyone's feelings, but it's very important. It's the most important thing to understand the terms of the debate and the consequences of its outcome. These are high stakes questions. You thought Quebec separatism was a big deal. This is a big deal, what you're living through. And not just you, but the entire West. These, these exact issues mirror those throughout the Anglosphere. That would include the United States and the UK and Australia and New Zealand. And for reasons that I can't fully comprehend, because I am not God, these trends are present in all of those countries at exactly the same time. And those countries are, they are on the brink of becoming not salvageable. Because the people who live in them have been completely broken and led astray, misled by their leaders, and ultimately replaced by their leaders. And that's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact based on the numbers. And anyone who tells you, oh, that's a racist conspiracy theory, lay out the numbers for them. What are we looking at? What's the justification for this? Why are you doing this? As the people who were born here languish and decide it's better to die than to keep living here, why aren't you helping? So here's, here's my advice. First thing you need to do, I think, in this country is figure out a way to tell people what's happening. And I would do it in a very Canadian style, in a non-inflammatory, highly rational, super polite, nice, but also uncompromising way. These are the stakes. This is the truth. I'm going to stand on the truth. Unfortunately, you don't have, a, you have a couple of wonderful media outlets who I've spent a lot of time with in this country, but they're small. And they should be huge. All of your media, yeah, that's right, that's what I was thinking of. All of your media, with only a few exceptions, are controlled by the state. It's not just CDC, CBC. We have an institution in our country called the CDC, which is almost, <laughs> almost as sinister. Uh, but you need a way for Canadians to know what's happening and to understand. You need a way. And it can't just be about Justin Trudeau, who's, if I, could, if I can just say, so absurd that that guy is going to sashay off into history fairly soon, I think. Yeah! Because, I mean, honestly, someone told me last night, I was talking to someone, um, to one of your countrymen at dinner last night, and Justin Trudeau, is, who I've never met, though I know his cousin Gavin Newsom, but <laughs> he, he's so... Uh, he's so ridiculous. He's so transparently phony. I mean, I just, I'm mesmerized watching him. And so my very obvious, as a foreigner, question at dinner was, does anyone believe him? And everyone at the table said, oh, oh yeah, young people do. And I hope that's not true. No, it's not true. But the point is, there can't be more than 20% of Canadians who thinks who think he's not repulsive, because he's just so obviously repulsive. Would you leave your kids with him? No. Would you be like, oh, you know, we're going to, we need to go, go to Canadian Tire for an hour. Oh, Justin, can you watch my kids? <laughs> I, I don't think you're going to do that. But you hand him your country. is totally cool. Don't worry. He's a good steward. Um, but he will collapse under the weight of his own ludicrousness and go back to Cuba or do whatever he does. <laughs> but... You know, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's just too great to check. Uh, though if I ever meet him, I'm going to demand a 23 in me, like, right away. Uh, but he will, he will disappear from the world stage, and 
you know, I don't think history is going to treat him well. And he'll probably be like a university professor or work for Bill Gates or something equally ignominious. But, um, but the problem won't end there because he is part of a structure that is itself rotten and in fact that it, you know, has elevated him to the top. And that's really the problem. And the only solution is for not radical people, but just clear thinking people to say, absolutely not. And here's why. And to stand firm in the face of their kryptonite. And their kryptonite is the word racist. And as someone who's been called racist like 50,000 times, I have kind of a PhD in this. <laughs> and here's what I've learned. I'll never forget the first time that uh, somebody on some other channel, CNN, or one of the totally discredited propaganda outlets in my country, was like, he's a racist. And wow, it really hurt my feelings. Um, and I thought, I can't believe they call me a racist. That's like horrifying. And my second thought was, am I a racist? Because when you're accused of something, I mean, it's just reflexive. Your first thought is to sort of take stock and, a and ask yourself, you know, did I do the crime? And I thought to myself, no, I'm actually not. And then I just said, well, then why would I be, I mean, if, if they said, you know, Tucker Carlson gained 30 pounds this summer from eating pizza, I'd be totally ashamed because, of course, that's true. <laughs> but every summer, by the way, my whole life. But uh, I'll admit it. Um, but I'm not a racist. So I just decided, you know what? The only people who can really be upset about being called racist are the racists. And the rest of us can sort of stand strong and smile and say, I'm not a racist, I'm sorry. I just don't like you, actually. <laughs> but that's the leash. That's how they keep you silent. And when they started calling people who question climate change, just cracks me up. In a country shaped by glaciers. Has there been climate change before? I'm just wondering. No. Oh, do the glaciers melt because of SUVs? No, I don't know. We'll check. Anyway, climate change. But when they started saying that people who doubted climate change, it's hilarious, um, were racist, I was like, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so my two pieces of advice, and I'll stop with this and we'll get to our panel with smarter people than I, um, is one, be strong inside, know who you are. If you're not a racist, it, it, it shouldn't hurt to be called one. It really shouldn't. Um, and two, I, I, I've been... I've been attacked for calling Canadians humorless or whatever, and as I've said, I don't think that at all. I do think you've lost an awful lot of good comedians uh, who fled your country to the South, because I do think it's hard to, there's a culture of, of self-restraint and of modesty here, clearly, and, um, and I think it's, it's hard for Canadians to sort of mock someone else because it feels forbidden, and I get that, and I appreciate that sentiment, but now is the time for mockery. It is. It is. You are, you are, you are led by buffoons in costume. You really are. And if Christia Freeland, Christia Freeland, fascist midget, and uh, and Justin Trudeau, perky little Justin Trudeau, those are your leaders, okay? And if you can't laugh in their faces, if your first response is, how do I get to a place where you, who I wouldn't hire to clean my pool, is running my country, get out of here, freak. Go back to your costume party. Laugh in their faces. Nothing is more empowering to you and more disempowering to them than laughter. Because the one thing they want is to be taken seriously. These are broken people. These are hollow people who are desperate for power because there's nothing else inside. There's nothing else inside. A normal person doesn't lust for power. He doesn't. He can use power to affect good, but power for its own sake is not interesting to him. In fact, it's dangerous and wise people stay away from it. And so the kind of people who do lust for power are freaks. They're sideshow freaks. And the last thing they want is for you to say that out loud because they melt. Like a vampire at noon, they just disappear. And the second you laugh at them, you realize 
how good it feels to tell the truth and you are empowered by the spirit of truth when you do that and you become stronger. And so I look forward to your mockery of the people who misrule you. Thank you. We love you, Zuckers! Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage.